Lesson one is a short section of the letter to the Hebrews. It is Hebrews chapter one, verse one through four. In many and varied ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has obtained is more excellent than theirs. Now let's examine some of the things happening in these verses. First of all, it begins, in many ways, many and varied ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. By mentioning that these revelations from God came to our fathers, the author indicates that both he and his audience are Jewish Christians. So that the letter is called a letter to the Hebrews, because they were Jewish Christians to whom it was addressed. But the author, who is anonymous, we have no real idea. There are lots and lots of guesses about the author, but we don't have a real idea who it is. So the only thing we can conclude from his own words are, uh, is that he's Jewish. And he looks upon the ancestors of Israel as his fathers, as well as that of his congregation. Now, this is going to be very important because one of the problems of this whole letter is that people who are already Christians are being tempted to leave Christianity. They're tempted to go back to Judaism. And the author wants to convince them to remain Christians. And that's the theme of this whole letter. Now, I'm going to keep calling it a letter, but it is better to understand that it is a sermon. It is a long homily that's written down. It doesn't begin like a normal letter. There's no addressee. Normally, if you recall St. Paul's letters, they begin... Uh, you know, Paul and Silas, the authors, to the church which is at Thessaloniki, you know, giving the addressees, and then gives greetings, grace and peace from God and from his son Jesus Christ, and so on, whatever the greeting might be. This has none of that. It goes right into the teaching because it's much more of a sermon than it is an actual letter. But we'll, every so often I will slip and call it a letter. So just remember that it's a sermon whenever you hear me call it letter. And I'll make reference to that throughout these, these lessons. So this sermon is meant to convince, and that's one of the aspects of a sermon. Like some letters, which are also meant to convince, a sermon is going to go back and forth between two types of speech. One is going to be exposition. He's going to give us teaching. And then he's also going to give us exhortation. So chapter 2 begins with an exhortation because a sermon is meant to evoke action from people. And that's one of the things that he's going to try to do throughout this letter. Right now, in this introduction, he's giving us something that we might think of as the overture to an opera. It gives the main musical themes in an overture. So also, this will give some of the main themes for the whole sermon. And I will make reference back to this opening as we go through other parts of the sermon. Because... We, it's important to see those links between the two. Now, 
Not only does he say that he spoke to our fathers, thereby recognizing his own Jewish roots and the Jewish roots of the congregation to whom he's 